So Barbara, in your research you advocate for an application agnostic rule, uh, especially when you talk about quality of service. But in your research, in your last paper, you admitted that even an application agnostic rule must have an exception since this rule will not be in Alaska at all. But how do you see how this uh, how these exceptions might be framed in the regulation? Yeah, so let me take a step back for a moment and just explain That's what the non-discrimination rule should be. So the first step is to, when you, when you think about non-discrimination rules, you have a whole range of options. You can say any discrimination is bad, so basically you have to treat every packet the same, or every discrimination is okay, and then everything in between. And the non-discrimination rule I su I'm suggesting, and that's the rule that the FCC adopted in the end, um, is one that says you cannot engage in what we call application-specific discrimination, and I'll explain what that is in a second, but you are allowed to engage in discrimination that is application agnostic. So the general idea is to recreate the environment that we had when the internet was first built where an internet service provider could not look into the packets to see what was going on on the network, and as a result, it couldn't do anything about that. And so now we are trying to recreate this environment through law by saying, even if you know what kind of applications users are using, you cannot act on that information when you manage your network or price services. So that means any criterion that's related to the application is prohibited. It could be what kind of application you are using. So is it Skype, but not other internet telephony applications? That's what we call discrimination against a single application within a class of similar applications. So discrimination against applications. And then discrimination against classes of applications is everything else where you group certain applications together based on something that's specific to them. Could be their technical characteristics, like these are delay sensitive applications, what type of application they are, what protocols they are using, so everything you can imagine. That's very important, so it's not a rule that says you can discriminate against different kinds of applications if they are not similar or have different requirements, and we can talk more about that later if you want to. What you can do is discriminate based on um, information that has nothing to do with the application people are using, how much they have paid, how much data they are using, at what time they are using the network. And the really interesting feature of that kind of rule is that it strikes the perfect balance between the interests of the network providers in managing their networks and being able to offer new innovative services and the interests of users and entrepreneurs and sort of society in having an open platform for innovation, economic activity and speech and whatever we do online. And sort of the reason this is perfect is because you can actually solve most problems in application agnostic ways. So I give you an example from pricing. If you wanna charge different prices, an application agnostic way of doing that is one we all know, so if, if you get more bandwidth, you need to pay more. But another one would be that's application agnostic. I have special prices for students or special prices for old people. But then we do not make distinctions based on what kind of applications they are using. By contrast, there are some pricing schemes that you see in Europe and in some Latin American countries where you actually pay a different price for the packets that transport internet telephony over packets that transport other stuff. That distorts users' choices on the internet because it makes certain applications more expensive than others. Technically, it protects applications against distortion of competition by ISPs. And you know that's easy to see when we talk about an application provider giving an advantage to their own online video application or even singling out a specific application for special treatment. But even with classes of applications, you know, often an ISP can hurt applications when they harm all online video providers. 
or all text messaging applications, or all online telephony applications. So just because it's a whole group, it doesn't mean you are safe. So you were asking about exceptions. You actually get very far without exceptions because application agnostic discrimination is immediately allowed. But then you do need exceptions for network management practices. And so the FCC adopted a net reasonable network management exception that if effectively says you need to have a legitimate network management purpose. The practice needs to be appropriate and tailored. That means only during times of congestion. You can't just throttle the network all the time. You need to wait for congestion. And it needs to be as application agnostic as possible. The as possible is really important because there are, while many network management problems can be solved in an application agnostic way, congestion management is a great example. Some can't. If I have an application that's engaged in a denial of service attack on my network, I can say, hey, you need to just shut down all applications. No, of course you need to shut down that application. And so the as possible is your safety valve. Or on a mobile network, you know, in general, they can manage congestion in application agnostic ways too. So you know, they allocate bandwidth among users, but they don't do it based on what application you are using. But there might be emergency situations or sort of a big football game where there is just far too much cell phone traffic where as sort of you might have to fall back on a somewhat more intrusive form of network management where you might make distinctions among classes of applications. And, you know, it might sound sort of quite complicated when you hear me talk about it this way, but this rule has been in effect in the US basically since 2008 for network management and the non-discrimination rule since 2010. And in Canada, we have had this reasonable network management exception since 2009, 2010. And so all the US and Canadian providers have been managing their networks in this way and it has worked very effectively. You know, you asked about quality of service. So that is an interesting question because, you know, quality of service is the ability to offer different types of services as part of the normal internet service. You know, the internet we use today only offers a single service, best effort service. You know, the internet does its best to deliver the packets, but it doesn't make distinctions. Um, uh, it doesn't um, provide any guarantees about when the packets will arrive or whether they arrive at all. And sometimes you meet people say, oh, but that's a problem because applications actually have different needs. Email is not sensitive to delay, but reacts very, um, doesn't tolerate packet loss very well. By contrast, online telephony is quite sensitive to delay, but can tolerate a few packets that are lost here and there. So these people might say, well, if I give a low delay service to online telephony, I'm not really hurting email. And, or they say there might be applications that might never exist if we are unable to offer quality of service on the internet. And on the other hand, a lot of people think, wow, but that would be really dangerous because it would allow ISPs to use the provision of quality of service as a tool to distort competition. And I'll give you an easy example where when I talk about quality of service, often internet service providers come to me and say, can I give low delay service only to online gaming, but not to internet telephony? Both are sensitive to delay, but the ISPs would like to profit from the added value that users get when online gaming works better, but they don't really want to make online telephony more competitive with their traditional telephony services. So we are worried that ISPs might use the provision of quality of service as a tool to distort competition. And at the same time that once you offer better services and allow people to pay for them, you always get an incentive for the ISP to downgrade the quality of the baseline service. You know, we know this from flying. Business economy class needs to be sufficiently unattractive to motivate people to pay to be in business class. And so we are also worried about the collateral damage for those who don't get the great service. 
So for this reason, there is discrimination involved and there are potential problems. A lot of people have said network neutrality should just prohibit quality of service. And they often also say, well, we don't really know whether we need quality of service because all the application that people always claim wouldn't work without quality of service work really well in the open internet. You know, for years people said, you will never be able to do online telephony without a low delay service. Online video won't work without low delay, and they all work great. So I think this is too black and white. And what many people don't realize is that there are different ways in which you can offer quality of service. And I have looked at them in detail, and it turns out they have very different costs and benefits. And so there is one way of offering quality of service that does not create problems from a network neutrality perspective. And that's the one I think uh, regulators should allow under a network neutrality regime. It has three conditions. We call it user-controlled, user-paid quality of service. So the internet service providers can make different services available, but it cannot determine or control how it can be used. So an internet service provider might offer the normal best effort service, but in addition, a low delay service and maybe a guaranteed bandwidth service and maybe a less than best effort service. But it can't, it just makes these services available. It can't say you can only lose, use my low delay service for online gaming. So we take them out of the picture. Second condition, only the users choose whether and when to use which service. So I might use the low delay service for online gaming, you might use it for online telephony, you might use it to upload a file on the deadline. That's the second condition. And the third is only the users are allowed to pay for it. The application providers can't pay. That creates all the problems with charging for fast links. This doesn't create any real problems because the internet service providers have no ability to discord competition because they have no say in who gets which quality of service. Users get exactly the kind of quality of service they need because they are the ones that make this choice. So if I'm just chatting with a friend, I might not want low delay service for online telephony. But if I'm doing a job interview, I might be really happy to be able to opt into the low delay service. And then it's also better for innovators because if I come up with a new application, I don't really want to go around the world and convince ISPs that I need this kind of service. They have no interest in dealing with scrappy upstarts from around the world. But I, as the user who wants to use this application, have all the interest in the world to make it work. So if I come up with my new application, I just tell my users, it would be better if you use low delay service and then you can do that. So that model doesn't create any problems for innovation or user choice, but at the same time allows the network to evolve. I said you don't really need an exception to my rule for that because user choice is actually an application agnostic criteria. So just making different services available that is not discriminating between classes of applications. And then the criterion is the user said, I want this service, and that has nothing to do with the application that I'm using. So you don't even need an exception. And so it might be interesting to know that in 2010, the FCC is explicitly clarified that its non-discrimination rule and reasonable network management exception would allow exactly this kind of quality of service. And the group of European regulators, Barrick, in a report also adopted this idea and said, you know, that would be a way, a very good way to offer quality of service that's in line with network neutrality. And you know, if anybody wants to read more about that, I've written a paper that's called Network Neutrality and Quality of Service that's available online and that explains all of this in a lot more detail. 